So this is um, Joe Muirhead, and Joe is a coach based in Sydney, Australia. And um, Joe is going to be sharing on the difference between clinical thinking and entrepreneurial thinking. And what I would love you to start with, Joe, is just to share a little bit about your background and your unique story. Oh, okay. So I am a rehabilitation counsellor by qualification. So I actually went to university with physiotherapists and occupational therapists and speech pathologists and ophthalmologists and the allologists. Um, so I, I fall into this classification of allied health professional. And people go, rehab counselling, what's that? Mm, let me just give you a very, very simplistic uh, overview. So somebody has an injury or an accident, gets really sick, they go to hospital, surgeons and doctors patch them up, right? They get them well enough to leave the hospital. And quite often you might need a physiotherapist to help you physically leave the hospital. They've taught you how to walk again or use your body in some way. And then you get home and then an occupational therapist comes and he goes, we need to reorganize your kitchen. We probably need to teach you how to drive in a way that's safe. And we might need to give you some advice on how you're going to do your activities of daily living. Now, like I said, this is very, very simplistic because any physios and OTs on the call are going, no, 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 very simplistic. Once a person has recovered to the point where they're kind of managing themselves pretty well, every single person will wake up one day and go, what the heck am I going to do with the rest of my life? That's where rehab counsellors kick in. So we are really good at helping people work out what you're going to do with your life once you've had an illness or an injury or some sort of forced change on your life. So that's the space I was playing in for 20 odd years. I still play in that space. And what I've worked out, having worked in federal government and state government and other people's private enterprises, was I'm not a very good fit <laughs> <laughs> or as an employee, um, I grew up in a household. My, my parents were self-employed. They had travel businesses back in the day when you actually needed a travel agent. Oh, my gosh. That seems like so long. You know? Yeah, I know. So this is my natural colour. So I've just aged myself considerably, but it's okay. Um, but what, what that entrepreneurial endeavour in my family taught me was that being self-employed meant that you always lived on the edge of bankruptcy, that everything was to do with money was a really big hassle. And um, I made the decision that I was never going to be self-employed. I was never going to work for myself because I watched my father have his first heart attack when he was 37, which was apparently brought on by the stress of being self-employed. Wow. Little did I know that it had nothing to do with being self-employed and everything to do with the money mindset stuff. So that's been a huge part of my journey. Mm. I started coaching allied health professionals all over the world in about 2011. Uh, I've got a lot, I do a lot of work into the US. I've done some work into the UK, do quite a bit of work into Australia about really helping allied health professionals reconnect with who they need to be so that they can serve the clients they love to serve and do it in a way that actually provides them with lifestyle, with revenue and makes them feel good about it because health professionals learn how to be health professionals because they want to help people. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of why we did what we did. We, otherwise, we would have gone and studied something else. Exactly. So that, that's a bit of my background. Hmm. And it's interesting what you said about the entrepreneurial ship, the entrepreneurship piece growing up, because my dad was a builder, and I truly believe I was selling leotards and selling off my leotards and making 50p profit here and there when I was about 11 onwards. So I always had that entrepreneurial mind. I was always a hustler. I, always, I started work early when I was about 11, teaching in the gym doing um teaching gymnastics as a bit of a hobby around my training you know yeah. um, and um that entrepreneurial piece was always with me because I started my first business when I was 19 and teaching gymnastics around my studies then went on to open gyms and obviously online business but it didn't scare me and it's funny that entrepreneur piece I as you say I would be unemployable now because one I've created flexibility and if you wanted me at a certain place I'd be like where do I put my children you know I need to, you know, um, where do I put these children oh I have to sit in rush hour for an hour you know so it, I think it is bought it's it, it's a massive piece of you and even if it's not you then once you get a taste of it it's very hard to then go back isn't it um, oh absolutely Absolutely. And similar to you, I started making handmade chocolates when I was nine. Oh. Um, and I would walk around my neighbourhood, give it like a print, hand wrote these little letters to put in people's letterboxes. And hey. I, I, 
always had some sort of side hustle, but, yeah. but I really got trapped in this whole, I need the security of a job yeah. and the security. And there was no security in that for me at all. None. Yeah. Government policy changes. Um, employers change their mind. I, I remember working for a couple of bosses where like 7.30 every morning I'd get a barrage of emails because I was in quite senior leadership management positions. I felt like my job description was changing every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, you think nothing stable. You've got to create your own future, 100%. So let's let's talk about now, Joe. Obviously, we're talking about between clinical thinking and entrepreneurial thinking and this is obviously um, a lot of our interviews so far with influencers um, on day one so far have been very much about strategy action niching um, very much defining your your authority and your leadership and speaking um, very much being authentic and pivoting in covid times and I really like this piece and that we're ending on this, Joe, because it's very much, it's controlling the mind, isn't it? It's controlling the yeah. inner entrepreneur. So share with us, what is yeah. clinical thinking? So clinical thinking is what most of us are taught when we uh, go to school or some sort of postgraduate um, course, and we're taught to work with clients. Mm -hmm. So it's where we're always looking at what does that client or that patient need? And what do I know to help them get from where they are, sad face, to where they are, happy face, which is, you know, <laughs> which is very similar to what we do with marketing, right? Yeah. But clinically, what we're always doing, this is the really, really big difference. Mm -hmm. Clinically, we are always assessing risk. So whenever anyone goes into a gym or even when you were training younger people in gymnastics, you were always looking at their posture. You were always looking at their run-up. You were always looking at how they were going to land because you didn't want that person to hurt themselves. Yeah. And this is kind of at the core of everything that anybody who works in health and wellness does is we're always assessing for risk. We don't even realize we do it. We are assessing trip risks. We are assessing seating risks. We are assessing posture risks. Mm -hmm. We are assessing mental health risks. We're just constantly doing it. We get so good at it that we don't even realize that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. But where that bites us as entrepreneurs is one of the key things that entrepreneurs do that clinicians, true classical cl clinicians don't, is entrepreneurs are risk takers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big time. So if you if you've spent five years studying and then you've got five years of experience under your belt, then you've got all these amazing neural pathways which are actually doing your risk management thing for you without you even having to engage it. So when health professionals or people working in health and wellness move into this entrepreneurial space, they all want the flexibility and they all want the lifestyle and they want the money and they want the notoriety and they want to make a significant contribution. But what we've got to get beyond is that things feel scary. Mm -hmm. We've got to get beyond the scary part. Yeah. So we can't control or manage all the risks when we go out on our own or we engage in some sort of entrepreneurial venture. And, and you'll notice the people struggling with this because they're the ones who go, what if this happens? What if that happens? What yeah. if this happens? Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who go, I can't go out on my own until I've saved up three months worth of wages for myself. I can't go out on my own until I have the most beautiful space to see all my clients in with the most up-to-date furniture. Yeah. That, that person is trying to control the risk. Now, those are financial risks. Those are reputation risks. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got how much insurance do I need? And then a lot of people get overinsured. And then, and then people want all the answers to all the questions, not realising that an entrepreneurial endeavour is a step by step by step. And the, and the next step reveals itself as you take the previous step. And I, I'm really pleased you brought that part in because, you know, I, I hear all the time when I'm working with clients, Joe, and I think, you know, we all have, it's when I've got enough money, I'm going to start. When... I know when I've taken a hundred courses, I'm going to start. When yes. I've got a beautiful, perfect website, I'm going to start. And you know what? You're never going to start. And I always say to my clients, you're never going to have the money sitting there because you need to get the results you want to get. You need to do something different. And when you invest in yourself, you will find that money. If it's, if it's the why is big enough, if that why is strong enough, you will find it. But 
you will also move quicker because you've put your that risk out there. If you're waiting till you've saved up the money, like you've just said, Joe, one, you've you've literally increased your entrepreneurial journey and taken a lot longer mm. to get started by saving up where you could have tripled that by actually starting your business. Um, so that money mind piece, and I like the clinical thinking behind that because it's the biggest thing that I see why people don't start their businesses. Um, I had someone come back to me the other day and she said to me, right, I'm ready now, Katie. I had a conversation with her 18 months ago. Yeah. And I now have the money. And she has been saving up. Bless her. Amazing. We got started and great. We're rocking and rolling. But she said, I wish I started 18 months ago because I just started way before COVID and, you know, all of that. So, you know, we can all wait till you've had the baby or you've moved house or this has happened. But yeah, just control that thinking and, and get started. So, and, and that's where it comes back to, it's not about the money. Yeah. It's about you trusting yourself. Money is such a expression of the value that we put on ourselves. And everybody's thinking that that value piece and that worth piece yeah. is charge higher fees or I can do this or I can do that or, you know, I'm going to do this from the Bahamas or I'm going to do this from Spain once COVID's done its thing. <laughs> but that value piece is actually how much do I trust myself? Mm. So I, I left jobs without having jobs to go to because I trusted that I would get a job I left employment not having a job to go through <laughs> funny story I gifted my entire life savings to the U.S. stock market because I thought that could be my silver bullet oh my um, and in three months I gifted them my money because apparently a trained monkey can trade the U.S. stock market but Joe Muirhead can't <laughs> <laughs> so I lost it all on the stock market. Oh, but you know, you wouldn't know. That's part of your story. You know, we've all exactly. Yeah. But then I trusted that I I knew what I could do. So I went back to selling my time for money, selling my experience, selling my expertise in a very very different way. And that was when I actually went, oh crap! I know what to do here. This is awesome. Yeah. And, and over the last 11, 12 years, I've just kept doing it. I had a massive shift happen last year. So in the, in, as COVID started, I was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer. Oh. As COVID, three months before then, my husband had been diagnosed with bladder cancer. Oh so God. holy crap, what do you do with that? I have trusted all the way along, number one, that we wouldn't die and we're both fine and we've had excellent medical care. Yay us. Yeah. I've been able to tap into this entrepreneurial thing and go, well, what do I need my business to do? What do I need everything else to be able to do so that I can just sit back and get the help that I need? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, why that's not a direct reflection, it's my entrepreneurial journey has freed me up mm -hmm. to be able to go, well, I need to make this decision. And some of those decisions were hard, mm -hmm. but then I also need to invest over here. Yeah. And I also need to invest over there because when push comes to shove, the person who's going to make this work for me is me. Mm. And I know that I'm a strong talking, black and white, no BS kind of person. So I can't go out marketing myself as a softly, softly, I'll help you along the way. We'll all be okay if we all do it together because that's incongruent with myself. Mm -hmm. So a part of this entrepreneurial journey for everybody. So as clinicians, the next thing that we're taught to do is you've got to wear your clinician persona. Mm -hmm. We show no emotion. We show no reaction. We don't over engage with our clients, which is impossible in this day and age when we are marketing our businesses. Mm -hmm. Case in point, all of us in the UK, in the US and Australia, we have these horrible regulations that don't allow us to use client testimonials and social proof. Incredibly outdated. They all tell us it's to keep everybody safe. Okay. Same in the UK with certain things as well. Yeah. But when we're marketing or when we're trying to attract and retain our clients, our ideal clients, we can't be clinical. Mm. Nobody wants to come, nobody comes to you saying, can you please see BT, my adjustment disorder? Mm. Could you please do that special manipulation around my neck? People come to us going, I have incredible neck pain and head pain, fix me. Mm. 
So again, as clinicians, we've got to get better at expressing who we are because patients, clients don't want to engage with us mm -hmm. as clinicians they want to know that we care they want to know that we're people first they want to know that we have real lives outside of what's going on they want to know that you're a mum Katie they they love the fact that you've got this amazing um you know history where yeah. you've done stuff that most of us could only dream of but when push comes to shove they just want to know that you care mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we could have all these photos of you, you know, in your leotards, even selling them, even training people in them. But that that's meaningless to me at this point in time. I want to know that you get me and that you care. Mm -hmm. So how do we express that? So, so the other important thing to remember with marketing and sales is they're not your clients yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. They're not so we can market and we can sell and be as authentic and, and engage in transference or whatever it is fancy words you want to use around it because they're not our clients yet. Mm -hmm. When we enter into some sort of therapeutic relationship, that's when things need to change, and we probably need to have a conversation with our clients about that. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get rid of our clinician persona that we've worked so hard to build. So the way I did this, here's a little trick. I'm a strong behavioralist. I, I Pavlov and his dogs, he's exciting to me. Uh, I used to wear different clothes. So when I was out doing my clinical work, because I've, I've had two different businesses running now for nine years. So yeah. when I was doing my clinical work, I had clinic clothes that I wore to do my clinical work. That's cool. Because that helped me put my clinical things back on. And then I have my clothes like this today where it's, my non-clinical work. So I'm a little bit more free, a little bit more able to do what I want to do. Um, and I don't have to be so kind of rigid and protective of everybody. So yeah. that's one of my things. So this clinical thinking mm -hmm. is awesome and great and when we're treating people clinically. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't help us in these other parts of our entrepreneurial journey. And we kind of need to find ways to shake it off and shrug it off. Yeah, so, so great stuff and really great content there, Joe. And I've, I've really loved how you've explained that because it, again, it's, and I've said this before, um, in the in, in the last couple of hours, a lot of our speakers, we've talked about being authentic, being real, being you, speaking your own language, how to bring out your personality online and how to bring out your personality in your business and all what you've just shared there with the clinical thinking and controlling your mind and your persona as an entrepreneur kind of all wraps it all up. I feel because you know it has to start here for all of the rest to come out. So what would you, what would you say, Joe, obviously we've talked a lot on clinical thinking. What would you be say would be the top Obviously, clinical thinking and entrepreneurial thinking go very well together. But what would be, say, top two points on how to think like an entrepreneur? <laughs> no, they oh. a little bit, but just to really clarify people so if they're writing it down. Yeah, no. So thinking like an entrepreneur, if you, if you, you want to feel free. So what you need to really clarify what freedom means for you. Okay, freedom is not the end goal. Freedom actually gives you things. So help yourself by going, well, what's freedom going to give me? And now try and ask that question about five times. What's freedom going to give me? It's going to give me um, opportunity to spend more time with my family. Well, that's what's that going to give me? It's going to give me a, a sense of, I want to do parenting really well. And what's that going to give me? I want my kids to be proud of me. Mm -hmm. So can you see how we, we came through through that? Mm -hmm. So making sure you really understand what freedom means for you, because most people just think it means freedom from a job. And mm -hmm. that's actually not enough. Entrepreneurs will actually do the extra thinking work. And that's something that none of us really have planned for in our time. Uh, we're all ready to go to the next thing. We're all desperate for the next client, desperate for the next course, desperate for the next summit, desperate for the next thing we need to do. And boom, boom, we read the experts. We're supposed to get up at four o'clock, do an hour of meditation, an hour of exercise, get the kids ready for school, make sure our partners are extremely happy. There's five hours of stuff already gone. So it's all right, it's 9 a.m. I'm exhausted. Are you exhausted? Like, come on. <laughs> um, 
So giving yourself time to think and, un- and realize that if you have never done this before, you've got learning to do. And that's the other awesome thing about being a health professional or working in this space. If you have ever been to school or ever done any post-school education, you know how to learn. Mm-hmm. So you can solve any problem that comes your way because you already know how to learn. Mm -hmm. So turn yourself into a lifelong learner. If you come up with a problem, if you go, I don't understand bookkeeping, you don't have to become a bookkeeper, but learn enough to know how much money is coming in and how much money is going out so that you can feel safe and free to know that you're not putting yourself in stupid amounts of debt. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. If you don't know, like me, I am I am not the most tech savvy person in the world. Okay, I'm not very tech savvy at all. And I kind of like that label. Um, I can learn how to use specific pieces of technology. But whenever I do that, I need to stop and be intentional about it. Mm-hmm. So learn to take risks. Practice just with little risks. Wear something different. Mm-hmm. Change up your routine learn how to learn how do you like to learn make sure that you have got really good learning techniques down so that might be the first thing you need to do work out how you like to learn I did that with my son when he was about 15 totally changed his schooling mm-hmm. um so those those are probably the top two how did he like to learn ah so he likes to learn he likes to get, be given the information some time to practice and work with the information but then talk it through with someone Okay. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a repetitive practice person. I don't need to talk it through with someone. I like to just, I, that is how I learn. I repeat, repeat in lots of different ways. So I might hair grind, okay. I might listen, I might watch, but I just need lots of repetition. That's the, that's the way I learn. But he's, he's different. My husband's the same. My husband likes to process by talking and he does that and that, that cements his learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's super, super important. So, um, learning how to be free, learning how to take risks, um, learning how to learn, any other top tips you'd, you'd like to give on entrepreneurial thinking? That, that it starts and ends with you. So if you are still looking for the silver bullet or the person who's going to give you that course that's going to make you a gazillion dollars or if you're still looking for a way out or you still need the security of this, that, like spend some time working on you Mm -hmm. so that you know that you have what it takes to be able to do this. So many of us like to have our contingency plans. If A doesn't work, I'll go to B. If B doesn't work, I'll go to C. Do that once so you feel safe and then put it away and then just focus on A. Mm -hmm. Because if you divide your time, you'll divide your energy. And if you start doing that, then A is never going to have the time attention that it needs to actually become successful and you'll just reinforce for yourself that you can't do this and it's wrong and it's garbage yeah and just going from what um we had a question from deborah earlier on being full-time in biz full-time in a job and how to go into your business and again very very relevant question i get asked that a lot and one of the things i say is You don't have to go complete cold turkey, i.e. you've got a full time job. You've never done your business, but you're going to literally day one, you start your business and then you decide on day one as well to completely give up the the, um, your career. My advice when I'm and a lot of my clients, because I help them to go from zero to six figures and to really be established in their first year of biz um, is I say, give yourselves a couple of months running your business part time Mm. and then jump. Because mm. just like you said, um, Joe, if that safety blanket is always under your feet, you will never fly. There comes a point where you have to go, I'm going to do it. Because you've always got that back door. And you might have a couple of tough months, but it'll be the best decision you've made because all your energy is, is on your is on your, your business and and you haven't got that safety blanket. You know, you have you've shut the back door, as it were. You so- have got a safety blanket. The safety blanket is you. Yeah. And you are, in the, you are in the driver's seat. So it's not a boss. It's not government policy. It's not closed borders. You are in the driver's seat. Mm. And that security for me made all the difference. And that's the piece I try to get to people. So I agree with you. Transition slowly into your, your business. Mm. There doesn't have to be the time frame that works for everybody else. But what you need to understand is, 
you will get to a point where you can't stand being employed by anybody else anymore. It, and that will be the catalyst that you need to go because you'll end up being a danger to that business. Yeah. But you'll get there. You will get there because you'll start to ex- you'll be expressing yourself differently. You'll experience this sense of fulfilment and you'll be energised by what you do. Energised does not mean you will not get, ever get tired. You'll still get tired, but you'll, you'll just find one day, Monday morning, having to go to work, getting on the train or getting on the tube or whatever you've got to get on going, I just don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. No, That's yeah. when you know you've, you've hit that spot. Absolutely, Joe. So amazing. Well, I could literally carry this on for another half an hour, but I'm just very conscious of time. I want to respect people's time. I know we've got a um, thank you, Deborah, for sharing your honesty. Yeah. So yeah, this is the time, Deborah. Um, and I hope you found this. So I know we've had so much great value and people have been so inspired from all our influences so far. So Joe, I know as we come to an end, you've got a great free gift for our community. So share a little bit more information and pop the link in the chat for everybody to get their hands on. So I wrote a book back in 2018, 2019, all about this entrepreneurial thinking because I wanted to understand it myself and I found out some pretty amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is quite a how-to book. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a mindset book to make you feel good. It, it will have that in it. And there's some great resources. There's worksheets available. There's a interview series available on Spotify and iTunes as well from the people that I've interviewed in this book. Mm-hmm. But you can get the first chapter, which also includes the forward and some other bits um, on a link in my website, which I'll, with bleh, website, which I'll put up in the chat in a minute once I work out how to do that. Remember, not tech savvy, but this is the book you're looking for. Um, and you can get it on, actually, you can get it on Amazon. So you don't have to wait for me to send it to you and all those koalas trying to swim across the ocean. <laughs> yeah, amazing. No, that's that's perfect, perfect. So thank you. I didn't realise you'd written the book. Amazing. Um, cool. So thank you so much, Joe. That was absolutely amazing. And your knowledge, and I can feel you've got such a wealth of experience. And um, it's, I said, I could literally definitely have you on my podcast one day, um, because I'd love to be able to carry this on. Um, so Joe, um, thank you so much. I'll let you carry on the rest of your day. We're off to bed in a minute in the UK. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I'm so pleased we had a chance to have you on the show for you to share your knowledge and uh, you have an amazing rest of your day cool. i'm going to switch off my camera now go find my link stick it in the chat all right perfect thank you so much joe take care